Hey everybody, Ruminate here. Hope this video finds you well. So today we are launching our first episode of TLDR. And again, if my 85-year-old grandma is watching, TLDR is an internet acronym that stands for Too Long Didn't Read. This is going to be my sincere attempt at brevity and concision, trying to squish my thoughts about a particular story down to like 10 or 15 or 20 minutes at maximum. It's going to be a hell of a challenge for somebody like me who likes to run his mouth. Now, uh, this episode, in addition to being the first episode, is also unique in the sense that we will be covering a video game. Now, as I've mentioned before in previous videos and in previous live streams, the fact of the matter is, believe it or not, I am not much of a video gamer. I can play video games, I have played video games, but I am not drawn to them in the same way that many of my friends and peers are, uh, simply because I don't have the attention span for it, right? So my nerd outlets are generally dispersed in other directions. For me, a video game usually is just an interactive movie. Uh, the gameplay itself is a means to an end to get from one cutscene to the next or one story beat to the next. So in situations where I can't draft a friend or family member to play the game for me, I really have to boot and rally and make myself play that game. Now there are some exceptions, and we're actually about to talk about one now. So in the three or four or five weeks that I was off at the end of Q4 2021, uh, I was able to spend some time playing Halo Infinite, which was released on December 8th, 2021 by 343 Industries. Now, the Halo series are a point of nostalgia for me because uh, they were my introduction, my gateway drug to console gaming uh, back in the early 2000s. And I bought uh, my first Xbox in 2001 because of Halo Combat Evolved. So I've been a big fan of the Halo series uh, ever since, and they have a soft spot in my heart. So, uh, just a recap for those of you who don't know, Halo is a multimedia science fiction franchise that is based around a series, a central series of video games, um, starring uh, the, the main character, which is John 117, aka the Master Chief. Okay, so he's a human super soldier who's basically mankind's last line of defense against very advanced threats, like uh, extraterrestrial religious zealots, you know, zombie parasites, uh, hyper-advanced forerunner civilizations, and on and on and on. So he's like this this helmeted, uh, masked, suited badass who just, he's a one-man army, and that's the primary appeal. The Halo title uh, refers not to a Beyonce song, but an artificial ring world that is at the center of most of the games, not all, but most, as both a setting and plot device, thus Halo. Okay, so Halo Infinite itself is the sixth game in the Central series, okay? It's a sequel to 2015's very controversial Halo 5 Guardians. So 343 Industries, which is the company behind these games, they took about six years to try to put together a, a, a really complex plan because, again, Halo 5 wasn't very well received. So essentially, they had 343 had three goals with Halo Infinite. Uh, they wanted to provide like a satisfying conclusion to the plot threads in Halo 5 because they weren't just going to ignore that Halo 5 happened. They had to address it. They also wanted it to be a course correction uh, to bring back old fans and, and get the get the series back to you know the days of the first and second and third Halo, which are considered the peak of the games. And then the third objective was to offer new players and and people who have not played Halo before new content that would draw them in. So people who, who enjoy like the Assassin's Creed games or the Fallout games, offering new types of content and gameplay that would pull these people in. So that is a hell of an ambitious plan by 343. The question is whether or not they succeeded. For my money, they did. Halo Infinite is not a perfect game and we're gonna get into the pros and cons at the end, but it is a resounding success in my opinion. The gameplay is phenomenal. As far as a Halo game is concerned, it's the best gameplay in the series. Um, the gameplay is fluid and kinetic, uh, the controls are intuitive, and the additions of new gameplay content like the grapple shot and the quasi-open world style, uh, it, it adds new dimensions to the gameplay. Because usually Halo is pretty linear and pretty intimate. I mean, they're decent sized levels for a first person shooter, but they're not these sprawling open worlds like many gamers are used to expecting. Uh, in 2021. So combining the age-old Halo FPS formula with a grapple shot that allows the Master Chief to, you know, scale mountains and, you know, launch over enemies and all these things, it adds a verticality to an otherwise horizontal gameplay. 
and also just vastly increases the scale because the, the Master Chief is no longer confined to corridors in a spaceship or in an underground tunnel. He is free to, to either traverse on foot or with vehicles a fairly large environment on Zeta Halo, which is one of the many Halo rings. Um, in addition, the, uh, Halo Infinite is the first game, at least that's coming to mind, in the Halo series to include boss fights since Halo 2 back in 2004. Uh, the boss fights in Halo Infinite are very exciting. They're dynamic, they're unique. Um, the, uh, the encounters, you know, usually require a variety of, like, unique tactics to, encounter, uh, to deal with that particular boss, and the environments themselves are vid very idiosyncratic. And the killers themselves, the bosses, range from, like, like stealth hunters like Chalak and, and uh, Jega Radomni to these really ferociously overpower, overpowering enemies like Bassus. So the bosses run a gamut. It's not like the same boss reskinned. It's not really repetitive. There, there are dynamic encounters uh, throughout the game. In addition, they also have, um, I don't want to say supplement game styles, but... Um, in addition to the main storyline, I suppose I would say the Master Chief also has other forms of content that he can do. He can, uh, you know, as he's traversing the, the setting, which is again Zeta Halo, he can recapture what are called forward operating bases, uh, which are human bases that have been seized by the, the game's enemies, the Banished, and the Chief can kill the enemies and reclaim them and essentially use them as a rallying point for humanity's, you know, survivors and the equipment that they carry. So uh, it increases mankind's foothold on the ring. That's one form of content. And then there's like a, a high-value target gameplay loop as well, where there are non-campaign, non-main storyline enemies and bosses and powerful figures scattered throughout the ring that the Master Chief can hunt down and, and get special weapons and, unique, again, unique encounters and essentially eliminate his enemy's uh, stranglehold on the ring. So all of these things make Halo Infinite, in my opinion, by far the best gameplay experience in the series. So bravo to 343 with respect to all things gameplay, from my perspective. Now, as far as the rest is concerned, we are going to delve into spoilers, and I probably should have you know, prefaced the video with that, and I'll make sure I do that in future TLDR videos. But we are going to dive into spoilers, because I don't think you can have any sort of meaningful analysis of a particular story unless you get into the nuts and bolts of it. So let's get into um, the prologue. Let's just start with the prologue first. I think that Halo Infinite has a fantastic prologue. Um, it's kind of like, it reminds me very much of Star Wars A New Hope, you know, where the Star Destroyer is bearing down on the Rebel Blockade Runner and it just sucks audiences in. Halo Infinite's prologue does the same, so it begins immediately with an epic space battle. Uh, hum humanity's um, gigantic uh, military flagship, the UNSC Infinity, which has been in Halo 5 and Halo 4, it's like they're one ship that can that can slug it out on even footing with pretty much any other ship in the galaxy by any of their enemies. Uh, well, this ship is attacked in like the first 20 seconds of the prologue. It's, a, it's ambushed by a group called the Banished, which are uh, extraterrestrials who were once part of the Covenant, which were the main enemies in the first Halo Trilogy. This is like an offshoot, but whereas the Covenant were driven by like religious extremism and fanaticism, the Banished are uh, very secular. They're very mercenary. They're just out for conquest. So even though they're not as big as the Covenant was at its height, their, their, their motivations and tactics make them considerably more flexible and I would argue more dangerous. So it's a beautifully rendered cutscene. We go inside the ship. The Master Chief is running and gunning in this beautifully, you know, filmed uh, scene where he's killing gov uh, uh, banished borders left, right, and center. He's just he's mowing down elites and jackals and whatnot, and he's picking up weapons, discarding them when the ammunition has expired. And then he encounters Atriox. Atriox is a is the leader of the banished. He is this hulking eight foot and a half tall brute alien he was uh, the primary villain in one of the offshoot games halo wars 2 
and we see a cutscene battle between the Master Chief, who has been this mimetic one-man army, this ultimate badass. We see the unstoppable force encounter the immovable object, because Atriox in Halo Wars 2 was built up to be quite a badass himself, in addition to being a tactical genius. So we see these two Apex warriors fight, and it goes very badly for the Master Chief. Um, this, to me, really sets the stake. This prologue is incredible because we see these two figures clash and the Master Chief gets his ass kicked. Atriox is stronger, he's faster, he's a better fighter. Master Chief isn't completely eviscerated, but he's, he's totally outclassed. And then Atriox essentially leaves him for dead. That's how the cutscene ends. Uh, the gameplay proper takes place effectively four weeks later. Uh, the Banished have essentially destroyed the Infinity, have scattered humanity. Most of the people on the Infinity were killed in action, but there are some survivors scattered around. And the Banished have taken control of Zeta Halo, which is the ring uh, around which the prologue battle took place. The Master Chief is adrift in space. He is found by a, a lone human pilot, uh, just called the pilot for most of the game. His name is eventually revealed to be Fernando Esparza. And uh, he fishes the Master Chief out of space. He revives him. And that's how the game begins. Now, as far as characters are concerned, the game did extremely well um, in, in giving a, a, um, a fairly dynamic cast, which is not the primary appeal of the Halo series, okay? So, again, the titular player, the main character, the player character is the Master Chief, um, who is who is very much wounded uh, psychologically from the events of Halo 5, you know, by the betrayal of his longtime artificial intelligence companion, Cortana, who's been a mainstay of the game since Halo 1. She was the voice in our ear. She was our guide. She was um, our ally when it was just us. And after the events of Halo 4, she became the, the, the big bad. She went rogue and became the arch-villain of Halo 5 which put her and the Master Chief in diametric opposition. And their relationship was like close allies and friends, even had quasi-vague romantic implications as well. So the Master Chief has very complex feelings about this person who betrayed him. And um, he's still wounded by that, so he's even more stoic and closed off than ever. I already mentioned the pilot, who is one of the primary support characters. You don't play as him, but he's a recurring figure throughout the game and the cutscenes. Um, the, the pilot is not a super soldier. He's not even a soldier, right? He is, spoiler alert, he's not even technically a pilot. He was a human who tried to flee the battle uh, against the Banished in the prologue, but didn't make it out in time. He just happens to know how to fly a ship reasonably well. He is scared. He is traumatized. He knows that he is completely out of his element, and he desperately wants to get home to his family, whereas the chief, who outranks him, uh, wants to investigate what's going on in Zeta Halo and wage a war against the Banished. So again, the pilot wants to leave for understandable reasons. The chief feels he's duty-bound to stay, and so there's tension between these two characters uh, as the game progresses. Uh, another supporting character is the weapon. So again, I mentioned Cortana, the chief's artificial intelligence companion who turned rogue. Um, she represented a tremendous threat to humanity in Halo 5. And in between Halo 5 and Halo Infinite, humanity desperately was looking for means to deal with her because she wanted to conquer the galaxy and she's an artificial superintelligence. So the best way they found to deal with her was essentially clone her. Uh, they created her in the first place, so they cloned her into a new AI called The Weapon. And it was essentially like a, a means of fighting fire with fire. The only way to destroy a rogue ASI, in their view, was to create a new ASI that could deal with her. So the weapon becomes the new Cortana, so to speak. She quickly becomes the chief's constant companion throughout the game, his guide, um, his, his technological asset, the person you know, giving him one objective to the next and advising him on how to do this and that. Um, and she is voiced, the weapon is voiced by the actress who voices Cortana, Jen Taylor. And hats off to Jen Taylor because she makes these characters feel very quickly, like completely different. Even though the weapon and Cortana are visually identical, 
and even though they have similar tone, Jen Taylor gives a very dynamic performance that allows you to distinguish between these two characters very quickly. Whereas Cortana was sassy and assertive and was willing to bark orders at the chief. She wore the pants in the relationship. Um, the weapon is chipper and bubbly and kind of naive. So she's much more friendly and open than Cortana ever was. And then, of course, the chief himself is as stoic and closed off as he's ever been. So that tension, as the game progresses, is very interesting. Uh, the big bad of the game was, was really surprising because it's not Atriox. Atriox, the leader of the Banished that I mentioned in the prologue, he's MIA by the time that the game properly begins. He is presumed dead shortly after his battle with the Master Chief in the prologue. So the primary villain of the game is Atriox's mentor, Eshiram. Uh, he is an aged warrior. Um, He's, uh, he's somebody who is like reluctantly trying to lead the forces of the Banished in Atriox's absence. And he and the Chief don't have any like personal encounters in the game until the very end. Uh, but he is a frequent, uh, he makes frequent appearances throughout the campaign in the form of holograms and some special cutscenes which show his side of the conflict. Um, Eshirim is a, is, a, is a pretty solid character, and we find out more about his motivations as the game progresses, but his primary goal is to test his mettle against the Master Chief. He's surprised the Master Chief survived Atriox, he knows of the Master Chief's legends throughout the, the previous games, and he sees himself basically as this, this old rugged badass who's at the end of his life and at the end of his career, and he wants to go out in a blaze of glory. So it puts, uh, puts Eshirim and the Chief on a collision course with one another. And then the last major character is called the Harbinger. She is uh, the secondary villain of the game and the final boss, spoiler alert. She's a mysterious prisoner of Zeta Halo who was released by the Banished uh, shortly before the game. And her objective is to release even more mysterious prisoners of Zeta Halo called the Endless, uh, which we've never heard of before prior to this game. Uh, and they're supposedly even more dangerous than the Flood, which were the zombie parasites in the first three Halo games, which are supposedly life-ending, you know, extinction events. So these guys are even more badass. We don't see them. We just hear... You know, people talk a big game about them, um, but in the game proper, we do not encounter the endless. So that's it for the characters. Um, so we talked about the gameplay. I talked about the characters. I really just want to break down in the end the good, bad, and mixed in terms of, of my take on this game. Again, as far as the good, the gameplay, um, with respect to graphics, audio, scale, and fluid combat, it, it's solid. It's the best of the series so far, by far, in my opinion. Uh, additional elements which are exclusive or innovative for this game, like the grapple shot, the quasi-open world, the, the forward operating base system, the high-value target system, these are really cool new elements to the Halo series that I think will, uh, that will encourage new players to pick up the series and also really intrigue older players as well. I know it did for me. Um, exciting and dynamic boss fights, again, it's not like one boss reskinned. Each of the encounters feels relatively unique in terms of the level design, in terms of the, the terrain, the tactics needed to beat them, and their strengths and weaknesses. So it's really cool, especially for a series that's not well known for its boss fights. So that was a welcome addition as well. Uh, again, an incredible prologue. Um, that's another great aspect of the game. Um, I almost think like, if anything, it probably could have been its own playable level. But that aside, as far as a cinematic is concerned, it gets you right into the action, it's visually stunning, and it shows the Master Chief getting his ass kicked, which I think is incredibly important, especially for a trope like the one-man super soldier army. It's very important for narrative tension, for villains to be a truly formidable threat to you, the player in a video game, or just the hero in general in any story. So to see Atriox, who's been built up in another video game and in the, the books and comics that surround it, for he and the Master Chief to have this confrontation and for him to decisively beat the Chief, and the Chief even admits it later on in the game that he just was outclassed. It wasn't, it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't an accident. Uh, Atriox is stronger, smarter, faster, he is an opponent unlike the, the, any that the Chief has encountered so far. And so moving forward, that, that defeat is going to sting the Chief, and it's going to motivate him to try to overcome it when he and Atriox uh, inevitably meet again. 
So it was a great cinematic and, and set the stakes very well. And then the last major great thing about the game, in my opinion, is the fact that the weapon, uh, the character of the weapon, is a real breath of fresh air. You know, the Halo series has its moments of levity, but for the most part, it's a relatively straightforward action-adventure science fiction game. So it can, it can lean very grim. It can just be one relentless explosion after another. So to have a character who is bubbly and chipper and is the exact temperamental opposite to the Master Chief, who is the stoic, grim, you know, taciturn, you know, super soldier, that dynamic and that contrast is very, very welcome. And again, a great performance by Jen Taylor. As far as the bad of the game is concerned, I don't really have much, but it's not perfect. One of the big ones for me is the bait and switch with, with Atriox. The prologue, you know, again, was really great because it put Atriox and the Chief on a collision course. We saw their first fight, their first round, where Atriox decidedly won. And then he's absent for the entire game until a post credit scene at the end, which reveals he's still alive. So the bait and switch where he's set up to be the arch villain and then kind of substituting him with Atriox, or excuse me, with Eshram, that's kind of a disappointment. Uh, I was really looking forward to a prolonged campaign and series of battles against an enemy as formidable as Atriox. Um, the Harbinger, which is the secondary villain of, of Halo Infinite, is probably the least interesting and least memorable villain in the series. Um, you know, she has just generically villainous lines and a decent voice performance, but we, we, we don't know anything about her other than that she just wants to release the Endless, and we don't know who the hell the Endless are either. So just very wafer thin. Um, she doesn't offer much by, other than just, I guess, you know, that, that trope of the, the existential ancient threat. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really disappointed with, with the Harbinger, and I think time could have been better invested either with Atriox or indeed Eshram. Um, and then on that, on that note, the last major thing I would, I would say is that the trope itself of the ancient existential world ending threat, it has its place, but it's, it's really tired. Halo already had that in the form of the flood, which again was the ancient or was the zombie parasites of the first three games. Uh, Halo 4 reintroduced the Forerunners, which were the creators of the Halo rings. They are an ancient, advanced, existential threat. And now the Endless. And it was almost kind of laughable in the sense like, oh, we have another one. And, but we don't, you don't know what they look like. You don't know anything about them other than that they're scary and worse than the Flood. Maybe that was meant to be ominous, but it didn't really register with me personally. It was just kind of boring. Um, in terms of the mixed efforts or the, the mixed bag, um, Eshram, um, you know, a great, great performance, a great attempt um, to make Eshram a relatively unique big bad, especially in the absence of Atriox. But um, Eshram's nuance in his development are only hinted at and then dropped on us at the very, very end after his confrontation with the chief and and he's mortally injured and the ch he and the chief after the boss battle have like a, a kind of a tender moment where the chief actually cradles him as he dies and the the dialogue towards the end suggests that Eshram again is this this tired you know soldier he's he's dying apparently from some sort of cancer or illness and that's part of the reason why he's motivated to go out in a blaze of glory against the chief um but there's also there's also some dialogue that suggests that Eshram is is really is full of regrets and he's doubting the direction his life took and, and all these things. But we don't really see that in in the cutscenes and dialogue that deal directly with Eshram. So there should have been more build up if that's what they were going. There should have been more cutscenes or more exchanges with Eshram where we actually see his regrets and his doubts on an existential level, uh, but we don't see that. So, mixed bag. Good villain and, and really great boss fight, but not what they think. I, I don't think he reached the level that 343 was trying to reach with him. Um, likewise, a solid, there was a solid attempt at making the Master Chief a more multifaceted character. He's, again, a stoic, helmeted. We never see his face. He's a stoic uh, super soldier. He's taciturn. Steve Downs does, does a great job of doing the gravelly, 
voiced, guttural intonations of the chief, but this is a character who generally lacks nuance in the games because that's not his appeal. His appeal is just to look cool and be badass, and he does that exceptionally well. Um, this isn't the first attempt to get more mileage out of the chief in that regard, um, but 343 tries, especially with you know what happened with Cortana, um, you know his new relationships with the pilot and the weapon. We do see some fairly compelling uh, emotional beats, but they rely primarily on the pilot, whom we've never met before this game, and the weapon, whom we've also never met before this game, and is also an artificial construct. Most of the emotional impetus uh, relies on them to kind of carry the chief through. So again, solid attempt, but it's not quite, I think, uh, what they were striving for. And then the last thing... You know, I mentioned that 343 had three big goals, and it was a really ambitious agenda, and, and again, broadly speaking, a tremendous success. But as a result, you know, it's to me, it's almost like the hate it's almost like the Avengers Endgame of the Halo series. You know, Avengers Endgame was, in my opinion, an epic conclusion to the first four phases of the MCU. But as its own self-contained story. It doesn't reach the heights, in my opinion, of Captain America the Winter Soldier or Black Panther or Thor Ragnarok or Iron Man or what have you, right? Because it can't. It can't be its own thing because it's trying to do so many other things at once and, and tie off loose ends and course correct and do all these things. So for me, Halo 2 remains the undisputed champion of the Halo games storyline of its campaign. Now, Halo Infinite eclipses it with respect to graphics, with respect to gameplay, with, you know, in, in so many metrics, Halo Infinite is the best of the series, in my opinion. But in terms of story and characters and whatnot, Halo 2 still is the one to beat. And I think a lot of that is because, again, Halo Infinite's trying to do so many things at once, because it has to. So that's a mixed bag. Overall, I would say between the good, the bad, and the mixed, I'm going to give Halo Infinite a solid 8 out of 10. I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in, in first-person shooters. Um, and even if you're not, even if you're more interested in games like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry, I think there's a lot here that would appeal to you. I also think I probably went over my 10 to 20 minute. Uh, yes, I'm at 27 minutes. This is what I'm saying. I'm definitely struggling with this. So the next episode is going to emphasize the TLDR more than this TLDR did. Again, Halo Infinite, 8 out of 10. I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, and again, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment. Any sort of engagement helps me, helps the channel. We're trying to grow this thing and hit 2022 uh, as aggressively as possible and uh, keep the momentum up. So I really appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. This is Ruminate out.